Yeah. So friends, it's been a lot of fun. We've been in this uh, sermon series now for uh, four weeks, I believe, and uh, we've been trying to kind of re-articulate. I love the way that we kind of re-articulate things over time, and we're taking a look back at our discipleship pathway. For the last decade or so, we've been using this language of connect, grow, serve as a way of understanding and trying to articulate the unique journey that Jesus calls disciples to go on with him. All right, the first week we looked at how there seems to be a slight difference between those who profess uh, faith in Jesus, Christians, and those who are called to a different journey of discipleship, those whose lives are being formed by the Spirit to uniquely reflect the life of Jesus, right? And uh, to do that, to go on that kind of journey, to walk with Jesus, we see him guiding us through these three different arenas of connecting and growing and serving, spending time with Jesus, spending time with other believers, right, being like, becoming like Jesus, growing in our faith and in our, our actions, forming friendships, lasting friendships with other people, right? And today, this arena of serve, actually being like Jesus, doing what he did and witnessing to the gospel in our, in our lives. And I have kind of noticed that if we're not careful with this language of spiritual formation, if we're not careful with this language of discipleship, what it can turn into oftentimes, and I think some of the reasons why it can turn off, especially Lutherans, is this idea because if we're not careful, spiritual formation can really turn into a type of like Christian Buddhism or self-help where it becomes much more about my own personal growth, right? Connecting with Jesus so that I can, can become this more centered and non-anxious person and, and growing in my faith and my trust with him so that he listens to me and I kind of have this special relationship with him. And if we're not careful, right, it sort of turns into very individualistic self-help type of wisdom, and God has certainly designed this journey for us so that we would discover our most authentic selves, right? Our greatest calling. But when we make self-help our goal or self-discovery our goal, we lose sight of where we are actually being called and, and for whom. And this is what Jesus addresses today in our, our lesson from Matthew 20, where he's talking to the mother of James and John, Zebedee's wife. We're not told what her name is, but she comes to Jesus after a time of teaching. He's teaching his disciples, his, his very close inner group, the 12, about what is going to happen to him very shortly. He's on his way back to Jerusalem, and right before the passage that we read, Jesus is describing for the third time how he is going to suffer and be killed and on the third day, rise from the dead. And when he's finished with that teaching, uh, Zebedee's wife comes with her two sons and, and asks a, a very, I think, um, sort of natural question, right? She says, Jesus, uh, is it possible, if it's possible, right, can, can one of my sons be in your kingdom on your right and one of my sons be on your left? Right? Could, could they have positions of power and authority, right? Is there an application to the Ivy League school that we need to fill out? Is there a deadline? What are the right kind of markers? Can I get them on the right track? Can I put them in the, the pre-law program so that they have the right, right? This is, a very, this is a very normal question for parents. I can feel it. My daughter's in seventh grade. I can already start to feel like, are we on the right path for a scholarship, right? That elusive scholarship. So it's a fair concern. I can hear it, right? She's essentially asking him, like, listen, you have been talking a lot about this new kingdom, this kingdom of heaven, and it's coming into existence because of your presence. And if this kingdom works anything like other earthly kingdoms, right, that we're a part of, then it's going to be really important for us to sort of navigate through and be great in that space, Right? Because the greatest sort of get elevated and, and they get the, the kind of in with people that they need. 
and, and it's this fear that perhaps they might get left behind, right? And what I love about this little exchange is that we see the heart of discipleship here, that, that Jesus does not rebuke Zebedee's wife for asking the question or for having that concern or for having that desire. He actually addresses the two sons, and he says, can you drink from the cup that I am going to drink from? Now, we could do a lot on the, the cup and what that really kind of is looking at, but I think the, the primary way of understanding the cup that Jesus is talking about here is the cup of God's wrath that Jesus is going to drink fully through his death and, and through his resurrection, right? It's this cup of God's wrath that has been sort of poured out or accumulated over time as God continues to see the destruction of his good world by sin and by death and by the devil, right? And so Jesus is saying, can you drink from this cup? But there's a secondary use of this, this idea of drinking from the cup, and it's really about the suffering that Jesus is going to go through as he journeys towards the cross. So as he lives this life of service, proclaiming the gospel and witnessing to the gospel, he's going to experience suffering as well. And so he's asking them, hey, this secondary suffering, are you able to handle it? And they give like a very juvenile, I feel like that energy, Did you feel like that teenager energy where they're just like, totally, we can. I'm like, yeah, but can you? You know, and it's like that. I could feel that, again, that, that energy kind of coming through. And, and what we would expect Jesus to say, this is what we are so compelled by, by his words, what we would expect Jesus to say is to rebuke them, right? Like, I, listen, guys, I love the youthful energy, but truly, you don't know what you're talking about. And, man, I would love for you to just walk with me and observe what's going to happen, but don't worry about trying to do what I'm going to do. It's, it's going to be tough. Right? It's going to be tough. But that's not what Jesus says, is it? And, and we might actually just gloss over this without even noticing right, the details of the story. But it's very interesting to me that Jesus does not condemn their desire to be great. He doesn't put a wet towel over their plans to suffer alongside of him, to follow him step for step, wherever it is that he goes, what, what he does is he actually redirects them and shows them what the path to true greatness looks like, right? If you really want to walk this path of true greatness, spiritual greatness, spiritual growth, then it will always be a path of service to the world around us, right? Jesus called all of the disciples together the other 10 and the two that he was talking to. And he wants to make this point very clear. He says, you know, you all have experienced, you, you have witnessed firsthand what the rulers of the Gentiles do. They lord their position over the people who they are responsible for, right? The high officials, they exercise authority not to serve them, but over them. But it's not going to be the same with you. He says, if you're going to be my disciple instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And, and I think that for many of us, this can kind of become a, a point of, contention. Is Jesus really calling us to a life of service in the same way that he gave his life, right? And in case we're a little bit fuzzy on, on what Jesus means here, and we try to do kind of the, the mental gymnastics to sort of get around it, I want you to hear the words of the one to whom he was speaking. This is from 1 John. This is John, son of Zebedee, we believe, saying this, he says, but if anyone obeys his word, Jesus, love for God is truly made complete in them. 
And this is how we know you are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So it can change your life. It can change the trajectory of your soul when you start to understand that faith in Jesus is essential for salvation. But it will change the trajectory of the people around you when you begin to believe that Jesus actually has faith in you. Not just that you can watch and observe what he has done or what he will do, but bringing the present moment into this space and saying, I will show up as one who will do what Jesus did. And that's, that's where that WWJD bracelet talk kind of gets to me. What would Jesus do? And, and, and I have a slightly different version of that question, perhaps, that I think would be really helpful for us. Because I do think that's the point where we start to kind of fudge off a little bit. We say, well, what would Jesus do is a pretty high bar. You start making the list of the miracles, essentially, right? Your favorite miracles. Jesus walked on water. Jesus turned water into wine. I've got a wedding coming up. Am I supposed to like practice up, get some jars of water, maybe do a little training beforehand. Um, I think a better question, what would Jesus do if he were me? Which doesn't have the same ring to it. <laughs> I understand. W-W-J-D-I-H-W-M. There's a lot to put on a bracelet. Um, but what would Jesus do if he were your gender, if, if he were in your place, if he had your personality profile on the Myers-Briggs, if he had your communication style and your commitments, right? if he had your responsibilities and your career, if he had your address and your resources. See, for the disciple of Jesus, this becomes the question that all of life is an answer to. What would Jesus do if he were me? Right? And I think that the simple answer, perhaps, would be that he would serve. That's perhaps the simple answer. But remember, Jesus did so much more than, than just the, the miracles that we remember and that have changed our lives. So if we're going to really do good work around this question, then I think we need to ask, what did Jesus actually do? And I want to just take a moment and look at three areas as we kind of finish up and move into a time of prayer. What was Jesus' actual ministry? What did he actually do in the Gospels? I think it breaks down into three really simple areas. Jesus consistently made space for the gospel, preached the gospel, and demonstrated the gospel. Right? I, I want to say it's, it's no secret that our increasingly sort of post-Christian culture is no longer warm or even at times neutral to the gospel. Right? It's mostly hostile, it seems, towards it. And this is news, this is new information perhaps, or a new way of living for some of us who are used to a different kind of status perhaps in the community. But this isn't new for Jesus and the way that he lived in the first century. And the way that Jesus created space for the gospel in hostile environments was very simply through eating and drinking. He would, he would show up at meals, and he would invite people to the table, understanding that, that to eat a meal with someone is to really start to develop a bond between them. And if Jesus had a mission of seeking and saving the lost, then the way that he accomplished that mission, his method was eating and drinking. That's the way that he would make outsiders who were hostile to his message, right, guests, and then, and then maybe neighbors, and, and ultimately maybe brothers and sisters in the faith, right? Jesus ate and drank with people 
so far from a pious um, way of, of living that he actually made people who were very pious uncomfortable. It, it was hard for them to actually believe that he was the son of God because of how hospitable he was to, to outsiders. And so, so that's the first thing that Jesus did in his ministry. We see again and again that he would make space for the gospel through simple hospitality. And the second thing is that he would preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel. And I just want to say, for those of us who are a little bit concerned, perhaps, with preaching the gospel, like, I'm not a gifted communicator, I don't have the words, I don't have a a great life experience, I just want to say that all of us are preaching a gospel. All of us have something in our lives that we are advocating for, that we believe solves some of the major life issues, whether that is a gospel of the keto diet, and cold plunges, or that is the gospel of, no. (laughs) I mean, at this point, we all have a very strange relationship with meat and vegetables. It's like we either all eat only them, or we never touch them. But I digress. So a gospel of health and wellness, a gospel of financial security, a, a gospel of of free market capitalism, or maybe the gospel of tolerance. But we're all preaching some type of gospel that answers the most fundamental questions of our lives. And and disciples of Jesus are simply those who are preaching Jesus' gospel. That's, That's the good news. The good news of Jesus and the availability of life with him in the kingdom that's available for everyone. And so Jesus would preach the gospel, but he wouldn't just preach the gospel. He would demonstrate the gospel. He embodied it with his words and his deeds. And this is where the life of a disciple will begin to transcend those categories that we have about kind of this is what I do at church, and this is what I do at home, and this is the person I am at work. It becomes our whole life of service to the world from whatever your particular vocation is at this time and whatever opportunities God is putting in front of you right now. This is the lesson that we see from our our first reading that John read just a few moments ago from 1 Peter, that each of us should use whatever gift we have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. It takes a lot of different shapes. The kingdom of God is pervasive in all areas of life. And and whatever it is that you have specifically received from God is meant to be used in service to others for for the advancement of his kingdom. And in the power of the Spirit, we are being given gifts to use in the demonstration of this gospel. What would Jesus do if he were me is an easy answer, but the particulars of how and when and to what degree and for how long, that is something that you and I answer together through prayer and through discernment every day. Because here is what we know about each other through the scriptures, through a life of faith, is that each one of us is called to a great life, a great life in Jesus. And a great life in Jesus will always be found on the other side of your great service. And the way that you have been particularly designed and equipped to live out your faith is not just a benefit to you, it is a benefit to the people who are around you, who will see you not just speaking the gospel, but demonstrating the gospel with your words and with your actions as your entire life is formed around the service of 
others.